I am just going to introduce our moderator, who is Mr. Paul Dixon, if you want to wave your hand so they know which one you are. Now, Mr. Dixon is himself an author who has published over six, has published 65 novels, including 11 bat and ball books. His most recent has won several awards. It is called Bill Beck, Baseball's Greatest Maverick. And the one most notable award that he told me is the Casey Award for Best Baseball Book of 2012. He also has a current book out called Words from the White House, and you can catch him speaking at the Rachel Carson Pavilion at 115 as well. So now I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Dixon. Uh, thank you very much for that, and um, it's a pleasure to be moderating between these two uh, 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 fine gentlemen. Um, I just want to acknowledge one or two people here. Well, we are, the, all three of us at the table have the same agent, which sounds like some sort of conflict of interest or collusion, but she's just, she's an extremely good agent, and Deborah Grosner is here, so I, we want to say hello to her and thank her for getting us uh, nice uh, arrangements for our books and good publishers for our books. Um, uh, David Stinson is here, as all, another guy who's got a baseball book out. I think he's got his own little little booth here today, so I just want to give David a heads up and, and, and a hello. Um, so that's that takes care of that. Uh, Again, I'm Paul Dixon. I want to bring these two guys. Um, it's going to be easy to moderate because they're both named Tom. So, uh, so, so uh, Tom on my left, Tom Oliphant, is, uh, as you probably know from seeing him on television, reading his columns and reading about him as a newsmaker. Uh, Tom has written a, a, um, a... Let the train go by. Let the train go. Tom has written a book called <laughs> Waiting for the Train to Go By. Which sounds like a Tennessee Williams That's play. Right. That'd be a good title, wouldn't That's it? Right. Let the train go Let's by. Let the train go by. <laughs> um, we get extra time. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk over the train. Can you hear me? Todd. Tom, Tom, uh, Tom wrote a wonderful baseball book um, called Praying for Gil Hodges. Uh, and it, 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 Tom was born in Brooklyn, as anyone from, who reads the book knows uh, deeply. And it's full of fascinating stuff. But I, I, I love the book. I grew up in New York uh, about the same time uh, and, and maybe a little earlier. But it was a phenomenal time. And that book is, a, is a, just a classic. And I recommend it highly, as well as a new book. So, that, that would be Tom on my left. Uh, Tom Dunkel is, is a, just is a New Jersey guy, uh, not a, uh, but, but he's a guy who has just come up with a, a book that I think about half the baseball writers I know wish they'd thought of before he did. Um, but it's called Color Blind. Uh, it's, it's a magnificent exploration of a little known uh, turning point in baseball history, pre Jackie Robinson. So rather than me bloviate anymore here, I've I've written my own baseball books, and if you want to talk to me afterwards about those, I'll do that. But these, I'm not here to be the guy. These are the guys today. So I'm going to ask them each to take about 15, 20 minutes and tell us about their books and tell us why we should be interested in how it relates to the theme today, which is baseball and society and dealing with trains. Tom Oliphant. <laughs> Thank you very much. By the way, <clears throat> since we're not talking about this one, please read it. Um, one of the, one of the uh, dilemmas, difficult things to investigate, both working on the Brooklyn Dodgers of long ago and the current work, was trying to figure out how people end up doing great and good things. And Bill Veck is, is one of those characters that you can't stop examining. He rewards every bit of effort you put into him. Um, to think that as a young boy, he had the vision that resulted in the ivy that covers the outfield walls of Wrigley Field, right, Paul? Yeah. Um, and that he could have been the person who desegregated baseball in the early 1940s as the owner of the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, but baseball stopped him. And 
you got to read my colleague's book to understand that while the Jackie Robinson story deserves all of its status in, in America, there were these little attempts, these little examples of what was possible in the country that occurred before 1945 when Branch Rickey signed him. And the story of what happened in North Dakota is uh, instructive in that regard, and you're going to love it. Um, it reminds me of another story. Um, uh, the same year that Jackie Robinson was thrilling America as a rookie with the Dodgers, 1947, the two African Americans who would follow him to the Dodgers, Roy Campanella, the catcher, and Don Newcomb, the pitcher, who always claimed that his breakthrough was the most important because he was a pitcher and here he was, a black guy, standing out up on a mound, throwing this ball at white guys holding bats. <laughs> um, and the year that Robinson came up to the Dodgers, uh, Newcomb and Campanella were playing double-A ball in New Hampshire, believe it or not, uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, and the Dodgers picked that farm team for them because you, you couldn't play on many of the teams uh, from here south uh, because they not only wouldn't let you play, <laughs> they wouldn't let you in the town in many, in many respects. And they went to this completely white little city in New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire, and were embraced, taken in, flourished, and made ready for the uh, amazing careers that were about to happen. Um, it reminds one of just how important baseball was in one very key aspect of American life in the, 19, in the 20th century. I always say that every good story about America is punctuated by race. Um, and what happened on the Dodgers, what could have happened in Philadelphia, what did happen in North Dakota, was a little illustration of how subversive baseball turned out to be of the established order in this country. Uh, the hands guiding it were human, fallible, uh, quite ordinary people in some respects and spectacular in others. Um, and this, this concept of saint <laughs> is something that we worked on uh, a great deal in this book, Baseball is a Road to God. Sinners, too, uh, making the contrast between what, how, how do you explain somebody like Christy Mathewson, the ultimate all-American boy, on the one hand, and Ty Cobb, as horrible a person as probably who, whoever lived. Uh, at his funeral, I think exactly three people from baseball showed up. So widely detested was he. He knew how horrible he was at the end, even. Um, and um, if you want insights into the human character, there is no better venue than baseball to see it. But I wanted to give you a little poetry uh, first. The, uh, the place, the special place of baseball in America has been noticed by writers for a long, long time. Uh, you, you really can't cite much in the way of novels of any profundity that have used football or, or basketball. <laughs> Um, but baseball consistently is used by American writers. And um, one of the first ones that examined in connection with this book was Walt, Walt Whitman, believe it or not, long before the Civil War even. Uh, one reason I'm attracted to Walt Whitman is that he was a newspaper guy before he was a poet. Um, and uh, wrote for the Brooklyn Eagle uh, about his wanderings through what was even then the greatest borough in the history of the world. 
And in one piece for the eagle, in, 19, in 1846, 15 years before the Civil War even, uh, this is what he wrote. <clears throat> in our sundown perambulations of late through the outer parts of Brooklyn, we have observed several parties of youngsters playing bass, a certain game of ball. The game of ball is glorious. I see great things in baseball. It is our game, the American game. Baseball will take people out of doors, fill them with oxygen, give them a larger physical stoicism, tend to relieve us from being a nervous, dyspeptic set, repair those losses, and be a blessing to us. 1846. Uh, more than a hundred years later, uh, a, um, uh, a part-time poet, John Updike, believe it or not, sat in the, um, the last row of the center field bleachers in the old Yankee Stadium and was inspired to write a poem that had Eastern religion, Taoism, as its, uh, as its focus. Um, it was published in the New Yorker uh, and then forgotten in 1956. And what Updike saw from that perch where I sat as a boy more than, more than once was not just the disparate parts of the wonderful scene that baseball displays to a fan, but the unity of it. <laughs> um, distance brings proportion, he wrote in the poem. From here, the populated tears, as much as the players, seem part of the show. He used the concept of Taoism to, to get at the idea of the unity of a scene and not just its components. It reminds me that there is, if you like the bleachers, and I love them, there is no more beautiful scene that baseball offers than to be sitting up there and watching a play with men already on base when somebody gets an extra base hit. And all the people, it's choreographed, it's like a ballet, do their assigned tasks. And you see, if you follow the ball, the action, but if, like me, you sometimes look away from the ball at the people, you can see all of these parts uh, fitting together. Or as Updike put it at the end of his poem, the inner journey seems unjudgeably long when small boys purchase cups of ice and, distant as a paradise, experts, passionate and deft, wait while Berra flies to left. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, one of the better sociologists, Robert Bella, uh, coined a term that gets at the heart of baseball's relationship, at least in this country, to our larger community. And the term he coined was civil religion. All the elements of religion <clears throat> without the extra worldly uh, dimension. Um, and, uh, and he wrote in describing it, um, although matters of personal religious belief, worship, and association are considered to be strictly private affairs in America, there are at the same time certain common elements of religious orientation that the great majority of Americans share. Uh, the, these have played a crucial role in the development of American institutions and still provide a religious dimension for the whole fabric of American life. I've uh, uh, often said in talking about this volume that if spirituality or religion is to have any meaning or validity, it has almost by definition to be universal. And if it's universal, it's everywhere. And if it is everywhere, 
why not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, uh, uh, there's one community that always summarizes for me the hold that baseball has on America, and it's St. Louis. Um, the town had a few rough moments during Jackie Robinson's first year, because it's River City, all, sort of a border state. Um, but by and large, St. Louis is the kind of place where booing is for Easterners. Um, they root for the home team like crazy. They play the game hard. But there's a spirit of community that you can always sense there. I remember being present for a game a few years ago that Randy Johnson pitched that turned out to be, he was on the Giants then, and it turned out to be the last game he won as a major leaguer. Um, and when he came out for a pinch hitter uh, late in the game, the, car, uh, the Giants were well ahead and were going to win the game. And as he walked off the field the last time, the whole stadium stood up and applauded. Um, and that's where you can see this sense of community showing itself, which, of course, anybody who studies religion knows all about communities. In our work, uh, there's a vocabulary lesson in, um, in everything literary. And for me, there are two words from this work that stand out, one that I hadn't used in years, and the other I'd never heard before. Um, it had been decades since I'd used the word ineffable. Um, a great word. <laughs> um, particularly because if you define it, you've already contradicted it. <clears throat> it refers to things that happen or situations that literally defy explanation. My favorite is, occurs in the bottom of the third inning of the seventh game of the World Series in 1955, the only one the Dodgers won after all this heartache. Runners on first and second, two out. Uh, Gil McDougal is up, Yogi Berra is on back. He, McDougal hits this slow roller toward third base. The kind of play that had always created hell for the Dodgers down through the years. Everybody was going to be safe. Phil Rizzuto was the runner on second. He's going toward third, goes into his slide, and damned if he doesn't slide right into the ball. <laughs> Taking the Yankees out of the rally, uh, the Dodgers scored the first of their two runs the very next inning. And how do you explain something like that? And the word ineffable occurs to me. And there are, of course, experiences in baseball going back more than a century that are that, are that way. The other word belongs to the theologians, hierophany, which is a true $10 word. There are some experiences that we have that are so special, they elevate us. They transport us. Um, and the feeling that results when you are being transported, kind of like watching David Freeze's home run in extra innings of game six two years ago that completed this amazing comeback. You could almost feel St. Louis levitate while, while the home run was, was landing. Um, and the wonderful thing about baseball, and I'll, I'll close with this observation and a, and a quote if I can find it, is that it offers us, it's slow enough so that we don't have to slow it down to think about it um, or to uh, uh, understand some of, the, some of the emotions that baseball still conjures in us after all these uh, decades. So we close by, by saying, oh, okay, baseball for most of us anyway is not the road to God. Indeed, it is not even a road to God. But if given sensitive attention, it can waken, awaken us to a dimension of life often missing in our contemporary world of hard facts and hard science. 
we can learn through baseball to experience life more deeply by embracing the ineffable joys of the green fields of the mind. We can enlarge our capacity to embrace the ineffable more generally. Baseball can teach us that living simultaneously the life of faith and the life of the mind is possible, even fun. Tom, Tom, take us to North Dakota. <laughs> well, I will. First of all, thank you for coming. Is this on? Anybody? Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you for reading books. Thank you for going to bookstores. All of us will hug each and every one of you after we're done. Uh, I have a drifting microphone here. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie 42, uh, the Jackie Robinson biopic. Uh, there's a scene in that movie that is an iconic moment in baseball history, and that takes place in Cincinnati in 1947, early in the season, Jackie Robinson's debut season when he crosses the color line. And we all know the abuse and the death threats uh, that he was being subjected to and the mutiny uh, among some of his teammates. In the break between innings during that game, Pee Wee Reese, who was the captain of the Dodgers and a raised in, born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, walks over to Robinson. Robinson uh, was actually playing out of position when he first came out to the Dodgers. He was playing first base. Uh, Reese was a shortstop. And he walks over to Jackie Robinson between innings and he puts his left arm around his shoulder. And what Reese was doing was signaling to his teammates that he was accepting Jackie Robinson and this was not going to be an experiment that would fail. And he was also signaling to people in the stands that day and to a much larger audience signaling to the country that uh, Jackie Robinson was here to stay in the major leagues and that this was an important moment. On the cover of the, the book that I wrote, there's a photograph, it's the only known existing team photo of the team I wrote about, which is a team out of Bismarck, North Dakota, primarily in the years 1933 to 1935 I'm writing about. And if you look at that photo in the back row, uh, it, the it's parenthetically, the, it, it looks to be a little bit of a bifurcated photo that all white guys are in the front row. But what the photographer had done was arrange people by position. So just by happenstance, those folks in the front row are infielders. And he's doing it first, second, short, third. And then in the middle of the front row is a gentleman by the name of Neil Churchill who managed this team and put it together. And then the back row is pitchers, outfielders, and catchers. Dead center in the back row is a tall, rangy, slim fellow that if you're a baseball fan, you probably recognize, and that's Satchel Paige, who uh, was sort of the glamour guy, the marquee name, and the, and the star on this team. The fellow standing next to him, and he's two pages left, is a gentleman by the name of Vernon Johnson. Vernon Moose Johnson was his nickname. He was a... Uh, power hitting outfielder out of the iron mine country of Michigan. And he's got his big, heavy, meaty right hand on Satchel Paige's shoulder. And if I was to stop now, that's all I would have to tell you perhaps <laughs> about the significance of this team. It very much foreshadows or is a precursor to what would happen in, in Brooklyn more than a dozen years later. I have been asked a couple of times how I came upon this team, and it, it was by happenstance, and you might call it procrastination. Us writers call it following our muse when we're, when we're drifting off course while we're researching something. But I was working on a story for the New York Times Sunday Magazine on aging, and I did a Google search, and as Google searches will do, it brought up, brought up a series of results that were somewhat off topic, uh, one of which was an obituary uh, about a, a fellow by the name of Ted Radcliffe, uh, and it was Ted Double Duty Radcliffe, that was his nickname. And this was in the fall or, or winter of 2007 when I came up on the obit. And Radcliffe had died two years before at the age of 103. And that was essentially the headline of the obit, Negro League ball player dies at age 103. 
which sounded a little more interesting to me at the moment than reading about aging. So I, I drifted off topic and, and read the obit. And there was a sentence in there that Radcliffe had played for an integrated baseball team in North Dakota in the 1930s. And it was a little more about Radcliffe in terms of his personality. His nickname had come from Damon Runyon, the famous New York sports writer, who had seen him pitch a ball game in 1932 when he was with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And what had intrigued Runyon is that Radcliffe was the catcher in the first game of the doubleheader and then switched gloves and came out and pitched a shutout in the second game. So that's where his nickname came from. And Radcliffe was said to be perhaps the only person that could out-talk Satchel Paige. So <laughs> I knew there was one colorful character on that team. And then uh, I read a little bit more and discovered that Satchel Paige had been his teammate out in North Dakota. And at that point, if, if you're a journalist and a light bulb doesn't go off, you need to find another profession. So I looked a little bit more into this team and learned about Neil Churchill, who was a white car dealer out in Bismarck, North Dakota, and a semi-pro baseball player in his younger days, uh, who was, for want of a better word, kind of the branch Ricky who, who pulled this team together. And they would go on to evolve from a town team into an elite, very elite, semi-pro team that could have more than held its own with uh, minor league teams and on a good day with some major league teams. There is a second pitcher on that team that I came to learn about who is not a well-known name, not as well-known as Satchel Page, and he's somewhat the, uh, the antithetical Satchel Page. He was a, uh, another tall, rangy pitcher out of Texas by the name of Hilton Smith, uh, very bookish, and he is also in the Hall of Fame now. Uh, he went on to have a long career in the Negro Leagues after this. So there are two Hall of Fame pitchers that came off this baseball team in North Dakota. The topic today being sports and society, I thought I would talk about three sort of grand undercurrents to this story that give it its shape and I think speak to how special this team was. And two of them, two of those elements will, will probably be fairly familiar to you and the third uh, may not be as well as well known to you. Inevitably, uh, this is depression time. Again, the, the focal point of this book is, is the 30s. And you can't ignore race at that time. And to put things in kind of anecdotal perspective for you, uh, there was a ball player on this team, a, a young African American, who came out of Chicago to join this team when Churchill started building it in 33 is when he actually began to integrate and build this team. And this fellow's name is Quincy Troop, and he was playing at that time with the Chicago American Giants. And as I mentioned, he's 20 years old, very good ball player. And he's backing up a veteran catcher on that team. So he's looking for an opportunity to play every day uh, when he gets the offer to go out and play in North Dakota. And two things to keep in mind with Troop. Uh, number one, he was born in Georgia and raised in St. Louis, and as, as Tom was saying, uh, a, uh, a grand and glorious baseball town. Um, in 1933, and this is the broad canvas of this story, uh, there were 26 lynchings in the United States that year. And no surprise, 24 of those people lynched were, were black people. One of those lynchings happened in, in St. Joseph, Missouri in 1933. And again, troop from St. Louis. And uh, as gruesome as this story is, I, I, I think it's worth passing along. There had been a, a black man that was accused of beating a white woman. And I'm not defending beating anybody, but this was not a murder or serial rapist uh, situation. 7,000 people stormed the county jail, uh, dragged this young man out to the courthouse square, hung him from a tree, dosed his body with gasoline, set it on fire, and then people were coming along and cutting off bits of clothing and keeping them as souvenirs. Um, when the governor of Missouri was asked to give his thoughts about that, the best he could come up with was no comment. Uh, that's... That's how stratified the country was that then, back then. 
at the end of the 33 season, when, when Troop gets done playing in North Dakota, he goes back to St. Louis, and their season that year happened to end before the Major League Baseball season. And he had said that white baseball players kind of traveled in a world that he did not really know or understand. And the presumption he had been raised with was that white baseball was better than black baseball. Obviously, because they're white, it has to be better. Uh, so he goes to a baseball game, his first Major League Baseball game he attends, and he goes to Sportsman's Park in St. Louis. And he has to sit out in the designated area of the right, right field grandstand, because at that time, Sportsman's Park was still segregated. And he has a, a somewhat bittersweet experience, I, I guess you could describe it as. He's sitting there watching the Cardinals play, and it suddenly occurs to him that these white guys ain't any better than him, <laughs> and that he could be down playing on that ball field. But that ball field, at the same time, looked to be about a million miles away to him because he knew in 1933 there's no way he's ever going to get a chance to play in Major League Baseball. Uh, that's kind of the racial backdrop of this story. Uh, the second larger backdrop or undercurrent is, of course, the depression and, and the economic situation in the country. I knew enough, and I'm sure you knew enough, about how arduous life was during the Depression. I always associated the worst of it with the Dust Bowl in, in Oklahoma. Uh, as I was reporting this book, I came to, re to learn and to realize just how horrific conditions were in North Dakota. And to put that in a little bit of perspective, uh, the 2010 census population for North Dakota was a little under, I think it was about 678,000 people. Uh, that's not yet as large as it was in the 1930 census. That's how many people left, 6% of the state left North Dakota during the Depression. And there was a, a real hard-bitten newspaper gal by the name of Lorena Hickok, who had worked for the Associated Press and the New York Mirror. And she was very good friends with the Roosevelt family, uh, particularly close to Eleanor Roosevelt. She joined the Roosevelt administration in early 32 and joined what was then called the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. And her job was essentially to chronicle and document the Depression, to act as a reporter for the government in a way. And she traveled all over the country, but in 33, in the fall of 33, she winds up out in North Dakota and Minnesota. And her job was to file dispatches, sort of boots on the ground dispatches describing how the depression was affecting average Americans. And she wrote letters back to Harry Hopkins, who was the, the sort of czar of, of federal relief uh, efforts back then, and to Eleanor Roosevelt. And she talks at times about being brought to tears by what she was seeing out in North Dakota. And when you read those letters now, it almost brings you to tears reading them. Uh, she wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt that October, and she was talking how beautiful the Great Plains are. But then she went on to say that if, she ha if I had to live out here, I think I'd commit suicide. That's how awful the conditions were. And she, she describes women having to, to give birth on beds where they were laying down top coats because the people had no sheets to put on their beds. And little kids walking around with their, which she saw with, with their feet purple from the cold. Uh, in the town of Mandan, which is the town directly across the river from Bismarck, it's, it's, it's smaller sister city, she went into a church one day. She was, she was on kind of a little fact-finding tour. So they, some people took her into a local church to talk with some farmers about the foreclosure crisis and crop failure prices and, and the crashing of the whole uh, agriculture out there. So they're in that church for an hour, an hour and a half, and she comes back out to her car, and she finds six people sitting in her car, six strangers. And they, being North Dakotans, apologized profusely. Um, they had taken refuge in her car because they were just so cold. Um, so North Dakota was a much beaten down state, and for Neil Churchill to have built a baseball team at that time that was that had a payroll that would rival certainly the Negro League teams. Uh, the teams on, uh, 
Most of the semi-proteins would carry a roster of about, depending on uh, what point of the season, maybe a dozen players or 15 players. But Churchill was paying very competitive salary. So he was matching Negro League payroll in a lot of ways and certainly outspending minor leaguers, which would have a, a larger roster but a, a lower salary. And the way Churchill was able to do this, um, baseball is a road to God <laughs> for some people. <laughs> uh, th some other people wandered off that road on occasion. Uh, Churchill did not smoke and he did not drink, but he was a chronic gambler, a uh, compulsive gambler. And he was, without giving away too much of the book, uh, funding the team out of his gambling winnings. So as long as he was doing well with poker, playing poker, high stakes poker, uh, he could afford the likes of Satchel Paige. Uh, the third element, and when we speak of society, and uh, this actually speaks to it more than you might think. Uh, this was a level of baseball that doesn't really exist anymore. It was sometimes called town baseball, often called semi-pro baseball. And again, we're speaking of semi-pro baseball on a very elite level. <coughs> and what had happened, and in, in, uh, I delve into this tracing the roots of this town team in the book is that as baseball spread after the Civil War primarily and pushes further west, particularly out on, on the Great Plains states and in the Midwest, keeping in mind that baseball had, had pushed no farther than St. Louis at that time, Major League Baseball. So these towns, uh, and that was the frontier out then. Town baseball became a, a, a great source of pride out there and became hugely competitive and the Bismarck Town team began in 1881, and by 1919, it was entirely semi-pro. What had happened with, with these rivalries between towns were almost, you could probably equate them to co collegiate football rivalries. Very intense, and also a lot of, of money being placed on games. And as part of that process, they began reaching farther and wider to get players, and when we get to the Depression years, uh, a couple of the towns out there started reaching out to the Negro Leagues. Uh, Negro League teams, like a lot of businesses in America, were having trouble making payroll, and for the right amount of money and in the right situation, you could get yourself a pitcher or catcher to uh, be a kind of a higher gun to play on your baseball team. Uh, the Bismarck team was not the first team to do this, and I don't claim that in the book. But what had happened in Bismarck was they, Churchill, again, the man who started this team, took it to a level that no one else had in terms of the quality of the team. Uh, again, two Hall of Famers on that team. In terms of the, how integrated the team was, it evolved into a team that was half black and half white in 1935. And by that time, all the players were coming from out of state, including the, the white ball players. And also a, a team, and this is the most important thing, that achieved a higher profile than any of these other teams. And the focal point of this book is in 1935, where there was a, a character down in, a colorful sports promoter down in Wichita, Kansas, who decides to pull together the best of the semi-pro teams around the country and get them together for what would be, we would think of almost like an NCAA tournament, although it was a double elimination tournament. So it was almost round-the-clock baseball for about two and a half weeks. And he had 32 teams come to that tournament. And it was an amalgam of, of kind of a top tier of eight or 10 very, very good teams. Uh, and then uh, being a savvy sports promoter, he threw in a, lot of, a little bit of quirkiness as well. He had a, uh, there was an all brothers team, literally all, all siblings out of Waukegan, Illinois, the uh, Stanzak brothers. There was an all Japanese team out of California an all-American Indian team out of Oklahoma. And he also invited f four all-black teams, which was very unusual for back then. And then he went way off the charts by inviting one integrated baseball team, which was the, the team out of North Dakota, out of Bismarck. And to give you a little bit of Id idea of how unusual that was for its time, there were a dozen major league scouts at this 1935 tournament. And to a man, they, en masse actually, they went to the director of the tournament, this eccentric promoter named Ray Dumont, 
and told them that they were not comfortable having integrated baseball team at this tournament. This, this was a violation of every social code that these guys knew. Um, there was a scout, one of those scouts was from the Cleveland Indians, a guy named Sai Slapnika, which is a, uh, sounds like a baseball scout name. In the first game of that tournament, the Satchel Page pitches. Uh, he's pitching against an all-black all black team out of uh, Monroe, Louisiana. And he's not feeling that well that day, but he goes on to strike out 17 guys. He had, he had, Satchel was prone to, uh, to all sorts of stomach eruptions. He said he had drank some bad water. Uh, but he strikes out 17 guys on a day when he didn't even feel like pitching. And this Cleveland scout goes on the radio during that game and uh, I'd read the quote, but I can paraphrase it well enough to give you an idea of, of the tenor of the times. And he goes, um, it's a pity there's, there's not a, a special kind of bleach that we can put on these colored boys because if we brought these guys up to the major leagues, we could win a pennant. Now, bad enough you say that, but to say it <laughs> on the radio, uh, that's uh, what the tenor of the times uh, were back then. And I thought I would just close this by reading a, a, a different passage, but just to, to give you an idea of, of the passion for, for baseball with these little towns back then, because that's in part what made this team possible. And Churchill, again, was a product of that. Out of, he grew up in a small little lumber town in Wisconsin. Uh, and again, I mentioned he had, he had played semi-pro ball there. He was a catcher, and he knew baseball quite well, and I think that's another reason why he was inspired to... We're just about out of time. Okay. Uh, then I will leave that passage, and we don't need... I was looking for the sign from the, yeah. the clock man. I missed him. So, okay, that's, uh, that's fine. We can go to Q&A. Um, I think... I think we're down to just a, a very few minutes here. Uh, uh, but I just, before we could take a couple questions real quickly, I want to remind you that the panel will be at the um, Politics and Pros uh, area for signing after, as soon as we break up here. And somebody could tell us where that is? Um, I can't. Right okay, we got it, okay. Um, so I, I think we probably have one question for each of these two fine uh, authors here today. Yes, sir. Why do you think that Branch Rickey decided upon uh, Robinson to integrate the major leagues as opposed yeah. to Satchel Page or some of the others? Before, before I answer, uh, uh, interestingly, Churchill was the guy's name in Bismarck. Branch Rickey was a catcher, too. Yes. <clears throat> um, and I, it's hard not to wonder. Uh, there's, there is a wisdom in catchers that... That, that you don't find always in, in other positions. And I've always, you know, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about that the two, two people who went against their times uh, were catchers first before they were anything else. Um, the, the, the key factor for Ricky well, he was completely aware of what he was going to do, what the implications of it were, what the impact of it c potentially could be and could not be. And what mattered to him was finding somebody, not necessarily Robinson, who had no baggage from having endured the hell of the Negro Leagues, which, don't forget, was also psychological. Um, I can't imagine what it must have felt like to, be, to know you were at the absolute pinnacle of your profession, and yet to also know that you were forever pigeonholed in one little corner. So he was looking for somebody who didn't carry all those years of hell. Robinson played in Kansas City on a Negro, but just briefly. Unlike some of the more established stars who resented what happened famously. Real quick answer. By the time they integrated, Satchel Page was then 42 years old. He was too old. Also, Satchel was a notorious free spirit, so there's a question of, of whether he would show up for some of those games after they were integrated. Uh, <laughs> 
Just very quickly regarding this Bismarck team, I wanted to point out a couple of things. I mentioned that big tournament in 35. In 36, right before that tournament, the assistant, the director of the tournament goes to St. Louis and meets with Branch Rickey, who was then vice president of the Cardinals. So Rickey knew about this team out in, in Bismarck. And one of the players on the team, Hilton Smith, I mentioned, went on to Negro Leagues. He suggested that the owner of the Kansas City Monarchs sign Jackie Robinson. And then yeah. Robinson went from there on to the Dodgers. You know, so nor is this an obscure story. I was having dinner a week ago with a guy who just retired as the senator from North Dakota, Kent Conrad. Yeah. And we were talking about what is, has been the impact of North Dakota on America. <laughs> what, what are the stories that survive and all the rest of it. And interestingly enough, two of the three that he identified were baseball. That team and Roger Maris. Oh, very cool, very cool.